Hello, and welcome to week six of FINA H111, History of Art 1, Prehistory to Medieval. Uh, this week, week six, we're looking at the ancient Etruscans, and we'll be discussing a little bit about how they uh, will form the foundation of what will eventually become the Roman Empire, which we'll discuss next time. So, without any further introduction, let's move right into talking about the ancient Etruscans. Here we are looking at a couple of maps just to give us an idea of where the Etruscans were originally located. Um, so the map on the left is an overall map of the peninsula of Italy and you can see where some of the uh, Etruscan strongholds were and where some of the other ethnic groups that are involved in Italy where they are located at. On the map on the right is a little bit closer view of Eturia and I have highlighted a few cities you might have already heard of, Rome in the south, uh, Siena and Florence, just to give us a sense of where we are geographically, um, to give us a grounding on where we are. Etruscan city, uh, societies, rather, we're not talking about a large centralized government or a uh, empire uh, with the Etruscans, much like the Greeks, uh, will have independent, fortified city-states. Um, these city-states will come together to form small confederacies. They had a small, or excuse me, a strong military uh, that will dominate uh, all the surrounding people. So what we see here is much like the Greek city-states. Uh, we'll have these small, independent cities that form confederacies, that can form these conglomerations, they will raise armies and then those armies will march out and try to bring other peoples and cities uh, and smaller states into the realm of dominance. It's by about the 6th century BCE that the Etruscan military has conquered much of the Italian peninsula, including Rome and the island of Corsica. And that of course will come into play as we move on. Um, there are going to be many different important Etruscan rulers. Uh, one of the very first that we know about is a fellow named Romulus, uh, who ruled from about 753 to 716 BCE. Um, and then the very last one uh, that we can point to is the last Etruscan ruler of Rome, um, Tarquinius Superbus, and we'll talk a bit about him towards the end. In terms of time period, what we're discussing with the Etruscans, from about the 8th century BCE to about the year 509 BCE, uh, that's the time period we're dealing with. So we're not talking about an expansively long cultural rule, but what we're going to see is we look at the artwork of these people in this time period. What we're going to see is some very important cultural foundation being laid uh, that will form that basis for what we see develop in the Roman Republic and then the Roman Empire. Uh, so to understand Rome, you need to understand the Etruscans uh, who were there first and who were the dominant power on Italy before the rise of Rome. I wanted to give you a sense of what Etruscan religion was like. It was very closely related in structure and hierarchy uh, to what we saw in ancient Greece and very similar to what we will see again in Rome. Um, here are just some of the major gods and goddesses uh, with their Greek equivalents. Uh, so you can see there's a very close relationship in the hierarchy. Etruscan religion was polytheistic, so they had you know, multiple gods in a pantheon. They did believe that the destiny of man was determined by the whims of the gods, very much, again, like how the Greeks conceived of their religion. They believed in prophecy and reading the signs of nature uh, by specialized priests or seers known as augurs, uh, and they believed in predestination. That is to say that uh, your, your destiny is laid out in front of you. You can't really challenge what happens to you because it's all been predetermined. Um, so all of these figures, all of these religious figures and these religious beliefs will form the foundation of much of the artwork that we see. Uh, but you'll notice that even given the, uh, the, similar, the similarities between 
uh, Etruscan religious beliefs and Greek religious beliefs, the two cultures' artwork is remarkably different, uh, with some really stunning differences. So the first object we'll look at is this fibulae from about 650 BCE. Um, and we find in burial tombs and these sorts of necropolises much of this kind of very fine work, uh, gold work and repuse and uh, some really beautiful jewelry and what is sometimes referred to as minor arts because they're smaller pieces. Um, <clears throat> Etruscan uh, advancement goes really between the 6th and 7th century BCE. Uh, between that time period, the Etruscans never met any real organized opposition. Uh, the growth of Etruscan uh, influence covered a vast area of the Italian peninsula, uh, from the plains of the Po in the north Campania, uh, in the north to Campania in the south. Uh, with their products, like this, uh, Etruscan merchants reached all the Mediterranean ports and were really the big economic rivals of the Greeks and the Phoenicians. Uh, so it's products like this fibulae that we're looking at here that really helps the Etruscans advance culturally and economically to become a powerhouse in the region. It won't be till about 545 BCE that Eturia uh, and Carthage will make a, uh, a pretty substantial alliance directed against the third emerging, emerging trading power in the West, which is the Greeks. Um, that will end a great deal of piracy between the Etruscans and the Phoenicians and further granting the Etruscans control of the sea. So about 545, with the establishment of this trade agreement between Eturia and Carthage, um, the Etruscans are able to get essentially a trade monopoly uh, across the Mediterranean. This very much upsets the Greeks, and we'll talk a little bit about what was the eventual Greek response to that. Uh, but what it's doing for the Etruscans is it allows them to um, have a vast market for objects like this fibulae. Now, fibulae uh, is a piece of jewelry. It's like a pin. It's something that might have been attached to clothing. And the Etruscans very much like these sorts of fibulae that are uh, very, very elaborate. So you can see on the left, I have an overview of this fibulae. And then on the right-hand side, I have a nice, close detail. And what they were particularly well known for, these artists, as you can see in the right-hand detail, is this extremely fine work. Um, as you look at those little animal figures, these three-dimensional and then embossed animal figures, there's absolutely meticulous detailed work in there. Uh, it's that level of detail and then, of course, the access to the precious materials that you see here um, that really make Etruscan jewelry uh, incredibly sought after in the ancient Mediterranean. Uh, and they really had no rival in the Mediterranean at this time. Here's another example of Etruscan jewelry. This is a pair of golden armbands uh, that were recovered from the Regolini Gla uh, Galassi tomb at uh, Servitary in about the mid 7th century BCE. Um, now, this tomb is a very elaborate Etruscan family tomb located uh, in Carrere, uh, which is an ancient city in Italy, which is about 30 or so miles northwest of Rome. Uh, it dates to between about 600 and 650 BCE. Uh, probably scholars are thinking it was used mostly around the 640s BCE. It was built by an extremely wealthy family, uh, stocked with bronze cauldrons and golden jewelry uh, of the Etruscan origin in the Oriental style. Now, Etruscan art styles very much mirror Greek art styles. They had uh, an or orientalizing period, a geometric period, archaic. Um, I'm not going to get as in-depth into those individual styles as I did with the Greeks, but definitely be looking at those distinctions in your book. Your book will lay out that outline a little bit more thoroughly. Um, now, modern scholars did not discover this tomb until about 1836, uh, and when they found it, it was more or less in completely undisturbed condition. Uh, 
which allows us a great deal of knowledge of what was going on in these tombs. The tomb had two burial chambers located on either side of a corridor. The corridor itself was about 120 feet long, about 6 feet wide. Uh, the lower portion was cut into the rock, which is called tufa, the tufa rock. And the upper portion was built with stone blocks, uh, which created an overhang from the stone blocks extending above one another. Uh, it was covered with a tumulus. Uh, a tumulus is sort of a man-made mound, so they created a burial mound. Um, not dissimilar to what we saw uh, with the Mycenaeans, if you remember back... Uh, when we looked at Mycenaean burial uh, chambers. Uh, a tumulus is a little bit uh, similar to what we saw there. Uh, the tumulus here at this burial site covered the entire structure, giving it uh, the facade of something like a monument. Um, <clears throat> so excavations at the site unearthed a royal woman buried at the end cell and a cremated man in the right-hand cell, and many, many very elaborate items, gold, silver, uh, gilded bronzeware, a chariot, all kinds of things in there. Um, also found on the bronze bed uh, in an annex chamber was the body of somebody else, uh, whom we're still not too sure who it is. Uh, several of the items display 7th century BCE uh, Villanovian decorative motifs, um, and, of course, we looked at a fibula. Here we're looking at uh, these armbands. I have a couple more examples from you, for you as well. Um, so, because we have found these burial chambers more or less intact, we have a, a pretty decent sense of how the Etruscans felt about their dead uh, and how they were adorned and so on. Uh, so we do find precious artifacts like these armbands uh, associated with these. Um, we do find bodies interred in these tombs, although it seems to be that the Etruscans, for the most part, preferred cremation. Uh, and even though we'll see quite large sarcophagi, uh, cremation seemed to be the preferred way of dealing with the dead um, and disposing of the bodies. Uh, let's take a closer look at these armbands. We see lots of geometric motifs, small friezes of figures, a pretty elaborate clasp at the top to hold it around the wrists. Uh, we see a lot of emphasis on figures of mythology. At the top, you can make out a couple of lions surmounting a central figure. Um, these seem to be tales from mythology. Uh, again, not dissimilar to what you might expect if these were Greek in origin. Um, but as we'll take a look at some of these, we'll notice a lot of distinctive differences from the Greek. Here's another artifact from that same tomb. Here we have a gilded silver bowl. So it's silver gilded with gold uh, found from this tomb. And we'll see a lot of animal and human motifs done in a style uh, in accordance with the archaic uh, Etruscan style, which is, again, very similar to Greek Etruscan style. Uh, as you look at the rigidity of the figures, uh, the stylization of them. We are arranging them in circular registers that radiate out from the center. Um, and again, just some exquisite detail and craftsmanship going into these objects. So the fact that these are being buried with the dead, they're putting, being put into these tombs, is obviously very significant uh, because it indicates something about how the Etruscans felt about these burial chambers. Um, Archaic Greek culture does not is not burying the dead uh, with quite this level of honor and sophistication. Uh, Greek burials at about the same time tended to be more or less simple graves with some kind of stone, a stele, or a statue. We looked at Kore and Koros's uh, Koroi rather um, in last chapter. Uh, Etruscan tombs are going to be much larger, more elaborate, and filled with these precious objects. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So that's indicating uh, something to us about not just the difference in their religious beliefs, even though their religions uh, seem to mirror each other quite a bit, uh, but also just the 
relative wealth of these cultures. These confederacies of Etruscan city-states have at their fingertips much more resources. Uh, they're just a much wealthier kingdom than most of the Greek city-states of the same time period. Um, so that's an important thing to keep in mind. And every time we look at a new chapter and we start talking about a new group of people, um, we do need to sort of bear in mind a timeline where these overlap. Because obviously the Etruscans here, um, th this is all going on the same time as the Greek developments in the Greek mainland that we looked at last time. Um, and if you remember back to that and sort of look back at those slides and look back in your book on that, uh, you'll see that the Etruscan artistic uh, has a, a more sophisticated artistic level uh, than Greeks of the same time period. And that's probably to be contributed, uh, attributed to uh, this idea of just an increased economic stability and in a more uh, closely networked set of city-states working together uh, to achieve that political economic stability. If we'll just take a quick look at a couple of more objects from the same burial mound. Um, you see a couple of uh, hairpins and more fibulae. Uh, this one on the right uh, is an incredibly elaborate one. Uh, I see you see the full shot of the fibulae on the far right, and then there's an inset that's a little bit closer detail. Um, we notice in the left hand picture two fibulae and then this long hairpin. Uh, and we do know we just have many of these sorts of uh, luxurious but mundane objects. So a fibulae was a pen, it was a clasp. It might have been used to hold uh, your, your cloak on, to hold uh, two pieces of cloth together. Uh, and a hairpin is exactly what it sounds like. It's something that would have been placed most likely in a woman's hair to help uh, hold an updo uh, into place. Gilded and gold, very fantastic objects. We have every indication that wealthy Etruscans, uh, noble and royal Etruscans, would have worn these objects day to day. Uh, women would have worn these hairpins in their hair. Uh, that would have been a part of, their, of the normal attire of that upper class of Etruscan peoples. So now let's take a look at a couple reconstructions of a Etruscan temple found near Via. Uh, now when we talk about the architecture, about Etruscan temples, we're always going to be looking at reconstructions because we don't have any Etruscan temples still standing. Uh, unlike the Greeks, the Etruscans built their temples out of wood and terracotta uh, and materials that have proved to be much more perishable over the centuries and millennia, uh, whereas Greek temples tended to be built out of marble and stone and much more durable material. We will see some similarities in this style to what we saw with the Greeks uh, in terms of just the basic rectangular footprint of the building, uh, the idea that you have an exterior space and an interior space, although with the Etruscans, we'll notice that the columns are pretty much restricted to the very front of the temple, uh, where on the Greek temple we might, in the Proneus, we might have seen a small sort of entranceway. Here that sort of front porch, if you want to use a modern term, uh, is much more pronounced, it's much more obvious. Whereas in Greek temples, they had that peristyle going all the way around uh, the building, and you couldn't even really tell at first glance which was the front and which was the back of the building, which is very much on purpose with Greek temples. With Etruscan temples, we have a clear point of entrance, we have a clear front of the building. Well, notice that the shape of the roof uh, and the entire entablature is very much the same as with Greek temples. Uh, the difference being that the Etruscan temples typically did not have pedimental statues. They did put statues on the roof, as you see in both of these examples here. Uh, and we'll take a look at one of these statues that came from a temple here in a little bit. We also know that Etruscan temples were very brightly painted. Uh, 
they would the the columns that we're looking at were very often painted a bright red um, and then very bright bold colors would have been painted all over this uh, making it a very dazzling piece something that you couldn't help but notice um, in the smaller image in the upper right you see that the entire temple is set up on a tall foundation, a tall base with a central staircase that goes up. Uh, that's quite a bit different from the bases we've seen Greek temples on, but I'll ask you to remember this when we take a look at Rome. Early Roman temples will have very much a similar kind of layout than the Etruscans we see here. So let's take a look at an example of the type of sculpture that would have been associated with a temple like this. This is a statue of Apollo, who's roughly equivalent to the Greek Apollo, uh, coming from that same city uh, that we looked at before, coming at about 510 BCE. He's made out of terracotta, which is uh, a type of clay. Terracotta means baked earth or cooked earth. He's approximately six feet tall, uh, so he's a good-sized figure. And we'll just point out a few characteristics that make him distinctively Etruscan. Um, so we got this great size. He's about six feet tall. Uh, he's terracotta. And you can see where his arms have been broken. Uh, we can see that he's hollow inside. So that's significant. Think about this for a moment. So he's made out of clay. He's sculpted out of clay. Uh, he was probably made by being pressed into a mold of some kind, and then the clay would be separated from the mold, and then those individual pieces would have been uh, fused together to create the overall uh, statue. Um, so because he's terracotta and because he's hollow, uh, he's quite fragile. Um, you know, you can't you can't bat around a clay pot very much because it will eventually break. Uh, one of the one of the important features uh, of these Etruscan terracotta statues uh, is the great detail that we can get in, in terracotta and clay. Uh, so I have a couple of details on either side here. You can see on the left uh, a nice overview of his face. And what we're going to notice with the face is a face very similar to Greek archaic style with that smile, the extremely stylized eyes, the elongated features, um, the very, very stylized hair. And then on the right hand side of the slide, you can see him in profile and really get a nice sense of how that all flows. Um, not just in his face, if you look at the center image, you can see there's lots of fantastic detail in his robe and the folds of it as it cascades down his body. We do see a lot of interest in the musculature underneath the clothes, the clothes uh, that he's wearing. So this is a male figure, and he's shown clothed, uh, which is, again, makes him unusual in comparison to the Greeks, which we saw most of their male god figures uh, were nude. Um, you're going to notice in the overall standing figure this odd sort of conical shape between his legs. Uh, that's purely a support piece. They've put some decoration on it to make it a little bit more visually appealing. Uh, but it's simply there to hold him upright, uh, to make sure that he doesn't fall over. It's just purely support. This takes a fair amount of sophistication to create a terracotta statue of this size, uh, with this level of detail. Um, if you can see his legs, uh, there's some really nice detailing in the legs here. You can almost get a sense, as you look at the, the center image, uh, you can sort of see the color variation in different parts of him. We believe he was painted originally, so you would have had a flesh color paint and his hair would have been differentiated, um, and he would have been painted uh, in, in a highly stylized, highly contrasting color pattern, but more or less naturalistic. Um, so you just you know, imagine this brightly colored, brightly painted temple uh, with several of these life-size figures of gods and goddesses standing on top of them. Uh, it really would have been quite spectacular to behold. So we're looking at objects made about the height of Etruscan influence and power. Um, and so 
what we'll notice is a great deal of the artwork being made are either temple related uh, or burial related, uh, including some really fantastic sarcophagi, which is what we're looking at here. Uh, so here's a sarcophagi with this really great representation of a married couple on a symposium couch. Uh, and here we're going to see a lot of important similarities and differences between the Etruscans and the Greeks. Uh, so the Greeks also had symposia. And a symposia, a symposium was simply a gathering of people, uh, like a dinner party. People would come, they would sit, they would discuss, they would debate. Many of the great Greek philosophers came up and uh, uh, explained their great ideas at symposia. Uh, but in Greece, uh, symposia, a symposium was entirely for men only. Uh, the only women who would be allowed into these public discussion spaces would be maybe some serving girls and maybe some prostitutes. Uh, but certainly this was not a place where a man brought his wife. Uh, this was not a place for respectable women to be. It was quite, quite different in Etruria. Uh, the Etruscans treated their women much more... Um, how should I put it? Uh, they were much more generous with women in uh, in, in Etruria. Women had a lot more rights, they had a lot more individuality, uh, they had a lot more freedom than they had in Greece. Uh, in ancient Greece, women were pretty much expected to just be in the home. Uh, women were not really allowed to participate in public life. They had no rights to property, they had no rights um, to, to vote or participate in government. Uh, they had no rights, really. Um, in Etruria, quite, quite, quite different. Uh, women were allowed and encouraged to get an education, to be literate. They could participate in government. Uh, they could go to symposia. Uh, they could speak their mind. They could have their own ideas. They could participate in public events. Uh, in fact, Etruscan names, what we know about Etruscan names, people were identified with the family names of both their mother and father. Um, so that tells us something uh, very significant about how uh, women and female bloodlines were, were treated, that you acknowledge your, your maternal bloodline as well as your father's bloodline. Um, so throughout the height of Etruscan power and influence, women played a very active role uh, in Etruscan society. Um, so let's take a look at the sarcophagus as a example of this. Here we have a husband and wife. They are sharing a couch uh, in a symposia. So you should imagine that this is a couple. They're at this sort of dinner party discussion event. Uh, everyone, every couple kind of has their own couch, their own space. There would be servants coming around to all of the people in the room uh, with, with wine and food and everyone would be talking and discussing things, political events, philosophy, whatever. Here we see this couple engaged in that activity. They're reclining on this couch together. And what I really love about this piece and what I think is really significant about it, you see that it's the woman, the wife here, uh, who's in front of the man. She's gesturing. She's using her hand. She's trying to make a point. Uh, that sort of brings a smile to my face because I'm recording this lecture and I'm gesturing and I'm moving my hands even though I know you guys can't see it. I tend to, I tend to talk with my hands a lot. Um, but you can see that she's in the midst of a conversation uh, and she's trying to make a point of some kind. Her husband is also participating. You can see his hand over her shoulder. He seems to be gesturing. I always imagine he's just trying to, to get a word in, like he's just waiting for his wife to take a breath so he can get a word in. I think uh, some of us might be able to relate to this. Um, it's a very human portrait, and it's just a lovely, intimate portrait of a married couple and their participation in society. Uh, it's just a nice thing to see. It's not something we see in a lot of cultures. It's a pretty substantial piece. It's made out of terracotta again. Uh, it would have been painted. You can only see a little bit of paint left on the surface. Uh, the whole thing is well over six feet long, so it's nearly a life-size piece. And I have on the next slide uh, a couple shots of different angles of it.
So here's a slide showing us uh, a different angle on the couple, and then here's uh, an inset image where we can actually see the back of it. Uh, and you can really get a sense of the nice detail of these works. Uh, the figures are still very, very stylized. You can see in the beard and in the hair and in the body, very, very stylized, idealized. Um, <clears throat> seeing a lot of the same archaic features that we notice in ancient Greek culture, very similar to what we're seeing here. Uh, now the Greeks, I keep mentioning them uh, because we looked at them last time, but also because the Greeks and the Etruscans are sort of the major economic and military rivals in the Mediterranean at this time, and they will be constantly going back and forth with each other. Uh, the Etruscans uh, have a certain amount of cultural dominance during this time period between about the 7th and late 5th century BCE. And so they're very much in control of this part of the Mediterranean. Uh, but they do have a great deal of contact with the Greeks. And the Greeks know who the Etruscans are and what they're doing over here. And the Greeks, by the way, hate stuff like this. Uh, the Greeks wrote extensively, uh, a lot, about Etruscan immorality. And one, their prime example of how the Etruscans were immoral was the fact that they allowed women to participate in public events. Uh, they thought this was really unacceptable to allow women uh, a, a voice. Like I said, you, you were even named after both sides, your mother and your father's families. Um, women could vote and participate in, in public events. The Greeks were horribly offended by this and thought this was incredibly unimportant. And I bring this up also because eventually we're going to get to the decline of Eturia and the rise of Rome. Uh, and a great deal of why the Etruscans eventually collapsed is because they are losing out economically and militarily to the Greeks. Uh, the Greeks are the ones who will erode Etruscan power and the economy and basically allow them uh, to be absorbed by the rising Romans. Um, <clears throat> So all of this is relevant, this, um, this idea of people's interaction with different cultures. As Etruria eventually fades and gets weaker economically and militarily, what we'll see is the role of women will be uh, suppressed. Uh, so women later on in Etruscan society will have less rights and will have less ability to speak in public and will see fewer and fewer uh, representations of women like this one, where they're treated more or less equally to the male counterparts. Um, as Greek influence increases, those Greek social attitudes about gender will start to come into the region and affect the artwork and affect uh, Etruscan society overall. So let's take a look at where we might have found some of these sarcophagi. Uh, in the interior of some Etruscan tombs at Certaveri and uh, Tarquina. Um, <clears throat> we'll take a look at a couple distinctive tombs. This is the so-called Tomb of the Reliefs. That is a title that uh, later art historians and archaeologists gave to the tomb when they dug it up, for obvious reasons, I think, as you look around here. Um, you'll notice that every every flat surface of this tomb uh, is covered with some sort of relief. We see some chariots and animals. We see a lot of ordinary objects as well. Um, household objects, uh, engaged columns, things like that. Those niches that you're seeing uh, in the walls there, that's where people would have been entombed. That's where a sarcophagus containing either the body, but more likely the cremated remains of certain family members would have been. So these are family tombs, uh, like a, a family mausoleum you would see today. Um, and in the next slide, we'll see a slightly different angle on this room. So another very interesting thing about the Etruscans is their relationship to these necropolises. Um, this is obviously a place of great ritual where we come bring our dead, our, our family members, and we inter them. Uh, but it's also a place of great liveliness, if that makes sense. We do know that the, the Etruscans didn't simply inter their dead and then leave these spaces and then seal them up and never go back to them. Uh, these were open tombs. You would come bring your 
family members to them and then you would go visit them on important days you would visit them periodically on important holidays feast days you would come bring a picnic to the tomb you would eat there um, and imagine a place like this with that symposium uh, scene that we looked at with the couple on the symposia bench um, and the idea was very much this was a place where you could communicate with speak to your ancestors access their spirits if you will um, through this place it was a city of the dead these tombs were houses of the dead uh, and there was a bit of their essence that still resided in here uh, and that's why these tombs are so well decorated. In many cases, like in this one, again, you see household objects. This was literally the house where your dead ancestors lived. Um, and by going back and bringing food and wine uh, and celebrating, you were celebrating their life. And you were celebrating the continuity of their family line and so on. So it was uh, not necessarily a mournful sad place for the Etruscans obviously people mourn when loved ones die but the intention was to create a space uh, that was a celebration of life uh, a place to honor and respect the life of your your ancestors uh, let's take a look at some other tomb decorations uh, in Etruscan tombs This is a scene from a tomb scholars call the Tomb of Hunting and Fishing. Basically, when archaeologists and scholars excavate these tombs, uh, there seems to be a motif that runs through the entire complex. Uh, and so scholars just name them after the motif. Uh, this particular tomb has lots of outdoor scenes, scenes of hunting and fishing. And that's what we're looking at here. Some interesting points to point out. Uh, you see these really nice, brightly colored birds flying through the sky. Uh, and the lower right-hand corner, and it is a bit dis uh, faded and distorted, you can just make out a few figures on a boat. And they are uh, riding their boat up this river. Over towards the left-hand side, you can see a rock formation coming up out of the water with some plants on it. Uh, and then just coming off of the top of that cliff, you see a figure facing down. He's diving off of that cliff to go into the water. Uh, so this is just a scene of recreation. People are out hunting, they're fishing, they're doing some diving and some swimming. Uh, and as far as we can tell, these were meant to be decorative. Uh, they were meant to bring that sense of life and vitality into the tomb. Again, to make this a place of celebrating life uh, as opposed to being mournful. Uh, it's meant uh, most likely in that respectful idea. Um, we don't know if this has the same sort of significance as Egyptian art. This idea that the soul must have these representations in the afterlife. Uh, that's a little bit, we're uncertain if it holds that specific kind of ritualistic function uh, or if it's meant to be more decorative and pleasing for the living people who are coming to visit uh, and reminisce. Uh, we're a little bit uncertain on that. The reason we have a lot of these uncertainties about the Etruscans is what we know about the Etruscans tends to be written about them from other people, mainly the Greeks. Uh, the Greeks were visiting Eturia and writing an awful lot about the Etruscans. Uh, like I mentioned with their attitude towards women, the Greeks did not like the Etruscans and had many negative things to say about them. So we have to take Greek history uh, of the Etruscans with a grain of salt there. Um, we can't really decipher Etruscan reading because we haven't quite figured out Etruscan writing yet. Uh, the Etruscan language is not an Indo-European language. It's not from the same uh, language uh, group that most other European languages are from. It was a very distinctive language. Uh, some scholars used to suggest that the Etruscans might have migrated to Italy from Asia Minor, and that would explain why their uh, language is so different. More recently, though, uh, scholars think that they are actually native to Italy, um, and while it's pretty amazing that they are native to this land, but they still have a distinctively different language, that's kind of rare, but it's not unheard of. Uh, so more recent scholarship suggests that they are actually native to Italy. 
Um, but again, it does leave a sense of mystery to a lot of the artwork that we see. Um, was this a part of a ritual? Was this a part of representing the afterlife? Did it have a more practical application? We're still kind of fuzzy on these things. Uh, in terms of the style, there's just some beautiful craftsmanship here. It does not look too dissimilar from what we saw uh, with the Minoans, if you remember back to the ancient Aegean culture. Uh, lots of very uh, similar themes, similar ideas, color schemes. Uh, there seems to have been uh, a great deal of stylistic similarity, even though obviously it's a very, very different time period uh, and a completely different geographical location. Here's another fresco. This is from the Tomb of the Leopards, so-called for the animals you see at the top. Um, what's nice about this one is it's a little bit wider shot. You can see the actual ceiling coming up. Uh, the very, very bright, vibrant color patterns of the ceiling uh, with the red and blue and green and the geometric checkers there. Uh, the back wall has a symposium scene. So you can see what I was describing before. Uh, groups of people lying on these benches, being served by servants, uh, having a conversation, debating political events, so have you. Uh, you might notice that there are some figures that have sort of a darker skin tone and other figures that are very, very pale. In fact, in this image, it almost just looks like an outline. Um, that's a distinction between male and female that, again, we saw in, uh, in uh, the Minoan culture. We also saw it in some of the ancient Near Eastern cultures um, and a little bit in Egypt, too. This seemed to be a artistic convention uh, of this vast geographic region uh, where male figures would be depicted with slightly darker skin color and female figures would be depicted with a lighter skin color. Um, regardless of the fact that men and women probably, you know, had more or less the same complexion uh, within these societies. Uh, that seems to be a, a cultural artistic convention that's very, very common across all of the cultures that we've looked at so far in this class, and a very interesting similarity across cultures. But again, this is a scene of society interaction, public interaction and debate, uh, and again, perhaps indicative of the type of attitude that visitors to the tomb are expected to have. This is a place for conversation, a place for eating and drinking and enjoying life in remembrance of our past ancestors. Here's another example uh, from one of these tombs. This has had a bit of restoration on it. Uh, to explain why it looks a little bit more vibrant. Here we see a group of musicians, uh, including the guy in the center playing what was called a double flute. And I'm not exactly sure about how one plays a double flute, uh, but here you get an example of it. Uh, and we also see a bit of how Etruscan musicians would have dressed. Very brightly colored clothes, uh, with the laurel wreaths around their heads and the sandals. Uh, again, just we get the sense that Etruscan society was very bright and vibrant. Um, lots of color, lots of music, lots of debate and conversation seem to be very important parts of Etruscan culture. So now we need to start considering the end of Etrusc uh, Etruscan rule. Uh, and the collapse of Eturia as a uh, political cultural force in the region. Uh, and, and a good place to start that conversation is with this guy, uh, Lucius Tarquinius Superbus, uh, with many apologies to my Latin professor in college, because I probably didn't say that quite right. Uh, but Tarquinius Superbus, we know, died in about 495 BCE. He was the seventh Etruscan king of Rome uh, and the last Etruscan king. Uh, he reigned from about 535 until the uprising in 509. Uh, so for centuries, uh, the city of Rome had been ruled by Etruscan kings in the Etruscan manner, uh, with the Etruscan religion, all of that that you might expect. Uh, it's not until 509 that the Roman citizens, uh, who for whatever reason, and uh, I don't know the answer to this, I haven't been able to find this in research, um, the Romans do not consider themselves Etruscan. They haven't been... Uh, 
absorbed into Etruscan culture. They believe themselves to be a distinctively different culture and a distinctively different group, uh, speaking their own language, having slightly different religious practices, and so on. In 509, the Romans start uh, agitating for a change in government, and what that means is that they will rise up in a violent revolt against their current king, Tarquinus Superbus, uh, and they will eventually overthrow Superbus and establish their own brand new form of government known as the Republic. Um, and obviously next week we'll be discussing what the Republic is about and how they operate it. Uh, but Tarquinius Superbus, the seventh king of Rome, he was the grandson of Tarquin uh, Precius, or Tarquin the Elder. Um, Superbus came to power through conspiracy by ordering the assassination of his predecessor, uh, Servius Tullius. Uh, and this is going to be very, very common. As we look at Roman rulers, there's a great deal of political intrigue, a great deal of um, one person assassinating another, and so on. Uh, because he became, came to power in such a way, Superbus did not have any true leadership qualities, uh, which may have also led to his eventual downfall. In fact, he ruled Rome in a very similar way to how he became king. He was only able to keep his position as king of Rome through constant violence and oppression. So what did he do? Uh, he declared himself supreme judge of Rome, which gave him the right to condemn anyone guilty without reasoning or listening to anything they might have to say to defend themselves. He used this power so often that he could ruin any potential rivals before they even had a chance. Also, Superbus took the belongings of each person he named guilty. Um, a fellow by the name of Lucius Aeonus Brutus, the man who would eventually overthrow him, uh, was a victim of one of these seizures. So. Etruscan rule was already starting to decline, and Etruscan cultural influence was already shrinking at the time that Superbus came to power in Rome. Uh, he was just such an awful leader and such a terrible king um, that whatever resentments or feelings that the Romans might have already had, contrary to the Etruscans, simply blew up uh, in a full-scale revolt to overthrow this. Um, now, Superbus wasn't entirely bad. Uh, he wasn't completely evil, I guess. Uh, he was very influential in building Rome's military power. He managed to convince the Latin League, which was a confederacy uh, of Latins around, into making Rome the official head of the Latin League. Uh, this tied the Latins to the Roman military machine, which in turn doubled the military power of Rome. Um, so, Superbus is doing an awful lot to solidify political and economic power in Rome. Obviously, uh, you would assume he's doing that so that he can have that power and he can have it at his control. That obviously didn't work out so well for him. Uh, this increase in power was used to take over the tribe of the Volsians, who are right next to Rome. Uh, the city of Gabi was also conquered, but instead of by force, it was taken by deceit. There's some more political intrigue here. Um, the riches gained through capturing these places were used in a lot of public works. Uh, the Temple of Jupiter Capitolinus was traditionally said to have been completed by Superbus, uh, although scholars today sometimes debate that. Superbus also improved the quality of many roads and fortified Rome's defenses. In order to accomplish these tasks, he used the force of the plebeians in Rome to do the labor. Um, so he's doing an awful lot, Superbus is, to build up Rome, to make it powerful. He may have had designs on trying to consolidate Etruscan power and leadership within the city of Rome. Obviously, again, he's just not very good with people, uh, and he doesn't solidify, he's not loved by the people of Rome at all, uh, and so it all turns against him. Um, so, all of the people in Rome fed up with Superbus. He's despised by the people. What finally commenced the revolution was a very unfortunate event. There was a rape of a noblewoman named Lucretia by uh, Superbus's son. Uh, the rebellion against Superbus began when he was not even in the city because he was involved in a military campaign. So, Superbus was out of town and people started revolting. 
Uh, Lucius Aeonus Brutus, who I mentioned before, was the leader of the nobles and announced Rome to be Republic in 510 BCE. The Roman army did not take long to decide that they would decide with the rebellion instead of their king, uh, and so Superbus was forced into exile. Uh, Superbus would try to regain his power in the early stages of the Republic, but never succeeded, and finally the monarchy was uh, pretty much put out. Um, <clears throat> So I'm only scratching the surface of the political intrigue here. Um, what we're going to call this period is sort of the early Roman late Etruscan rule, and we'll take a look at some artifacts that date from this time period. Um, Superbus is thrown out, the monarchy will be a abolished, and the uh, and what I find really interesting about this story is the military. Uh, the military swears loyalty to the king. Uh, they don't swear loyalty to the city or the nation. They swear loyalty to the king personally. But even the military says, this guy is no good for Rome. The, uh, the writing is on the wall. We're going to side with the rebels. And we're be going to become the Roman army as opposed to the uh, the Etruscan army or Superbus' army. Um, that's very, very significant. So obviously Superbus didn't intend this, but he lays the foundation for what will become the Roman Empire. Uh, it begins with the Republic. The Republic will expand and absorb uh, neighboring city-states, will begin to establish and uh, enforce their own control, their own language, their own uh, cultural prerogatives, uh, and eventually will form an imperium and an empire and will become sort of the biggest thing that Europe has ever seen. Um, all of that, I won't say because of Tarquinius Superbus, but he is very much at the turning point, this very important turning point of history when this all comes together. So some of the work being made by Etruscan artists still in Rome, and remember that uh, although the Romans may consider themselves different than the Etruscans, there are Etruscans living and working in Rome. Um, so we'll look at this as an example of an Etruscan piece being made in Rome with Roman symbolism. So this is the she-wolf or the Capitoline wolf. This is directly related to uh, Roman uh, mythology. Uh, the whole idea was that uh, there were the mythical figures of Romulus and Remus. Uh, they were abandoned in the woods and a wolf found the boys and raised them and suckled them to keep them alive. And that's what we're seeing here. This is the she-wolf that nurtured Romulus and Remus. Uh, Romulus, if you know anything about the story, uh, once the two boys grew up, Romulus will get into a fight with his brother Remus. Romulus kills Remus and then founds the city of Rome. Uh, and we actually know the date. April 21st, 553 BCE is when Romulus founds the city of Rome and becomes the first king. This piece is made in relation to that story. Uh, it becomes a symbol of the city of Rome after it's made. Uh, and you'll notice the date here. This is being made probably by an Etruscan artist who comes from that Etruscan tradition, but being made in the Roman Republic, the very early part of the Roman Republic. Um, <clears throat> what you'll see on the right-hand side, those two infants, Romulus and Remus, those are not original to the piece. Those may have been made in the Renaissance and added later. So we'll just pay attention to the animal, just to the wolf itself. Some beautiful detail in that wolf. I love the teeth. I love the face on this wolf. There's uh, a great deal of drama and pathos in the face of that wolf. It's not a vicious, snarling creature. And it's kind of interesting, I think, that the Romans really felt a kinship to this figure. Like I said, it became the symbol of Rome and the, city, the symbol of the Republic. Uh, and it has a certain strength and ferociousness, but it also has a certain vulnerability to it that I think is a very nice um, sort of cipher for the position of the Roman Republic. It's made out of cast bronze. It's about uh, life size, maybe a little bit smaller, uh, and really fantastic detail going into this piece. Here's another example of some late Etruscan. Uh, piece being made during the very early part of the Roman Republic. Uh, again, some beautiful, 
very skilled craftsmanship in bronze with this. This is called a chimera. Uh, and a chimera is based on a Greek mythological monster. Uh, it has some varieties what can be in a chimera, but it's basically several different animals combined into one. So here we see a lion. It has also sticking off of one side the head of a goat and its tail is a serpent. It's a pretty ferocious creature. Uh, some fantastic texture on the animal. You get a great sense of the flesh of the animal being pulled over the bones and muscle of the creature to create a very ferocious look to it. And in my next slide I have uh, some different angles and a close-up. So on the left hand side of this slide you see much better the lion's face, uh, its open mouth, uh, and again what strikes me about a lot of Etruscan works of animals, that wolf or this lion, uh, this chimera, uh, these are ferocious frightening creatures and yet the faces of the animal have a certain emotion to them which isn't necessarily meant to be you know, blood curdling. Um, there's something kind of dramatic and maybe even a little pensive in the face of this lion that I think is quite remarkable. Uh, on the right hand image you can see the backside of this piece. You see the goat's head sticking up out of uh, the other side. You see some wounds on the animal. Uh, you see the serpent tail. Uh, and you can also get a better sense of the texture of the mane. All of those little tufts of hair sticking up out of the back of the lion's head. Um, again, some beautiful craftsmanship in this piece based on Greek legend. So in the late Etruscan period, while it overlaps with the beginning of the Roman Republic, we'll see bronze work also uh, expand into uh, sacred works and works of gods and goddesses. Uh, this is a statue of Mars of Todi. So this is a statue of Mars. Now Mars is a Roman god. This is an Etruscan made piece, but we're beginning to see how Roman influence and Roman culture is starting to supersede uh, the Etruscan ones. Um, otherwise it's still an incredibly uh, well-skilled piece, cast bronze, uh, really quite on par with anything we saw in ancient Greece uh, in terms of its detail and its skill. It's missing some pieces as you can see over the century we've lost some of it uh, but a great deal of texture, a great deal of skill uh, and lifelikeness to the piece uh, and uh, again an interesting evolution where the Etruscan artisans are basically going to get absorbed into the Roman Republic um, and come into service uh, to new Roman masters. Etruscan artists are still making sarcophagi in a, in a traditional sense, um, even after the rise of the Roman Republic. Uh, but you'll notice there are some uh, dissimilarities between late Etruscan work and early Etruscan work. Uh, so if you recall back to our image of the couple at the symposium, uh, how there was a certain life to the piece, they were smiling, uh, they were engaged in conversation, there was a great deal of life and spirit within the pieces themselves. Um, and of course they were made out of terracotta. Now this sarcophagus of uh, Lars Pulena comes from about the second century BCE, so several hundred years later. Uh, it's carved out of stone, it's not terracotta, and we're going to notice just a different feel, a different attitude within the piece. Um, Lars here, he's by himself. We don't see the inclusion of a female figure. Uh, again, as Greek and then Roman influence uh, becomes more predominant and Etruscan influence declines, uh, the role of women is much, much decreased in Etruscan cities uh, to the point where they're not even represented in art in quite the same way uh, as they were previously. So Lars here is by himself. He doesn't seem to be gesturing or quite as active or animated as his predecessors were. And I'll just draw your attention to the frieze on the coffin, uh, the uh, sarcophagus below him. Uh, it's a mythological scene where in the center more or less in the center, you see a standing figure. Now his head is missing because of age, uh, because uh, it's, the piece has been damaged over the centuries. But on either side of him, you see these mythological figures with hammers. 
Uh, and they are tormenting this poor man's soul in the afterlife. And you see these winged uh, spirit figures on either side. It's just a depressing scene. It's violent, and it's depressing, uh, and it doesn't have any of the life or vitality that we saw in early uh, archaic Etruscan pieces. By the time we get to the Hellenistic period of Etruscan art, um, much of that has is gone. Uh, it's being absorbed. We see the Etruscan way of life and Etruscan attitudes being absorbed into uh, the Roman Republic, uh, getting absorbed into Greek attitudes that the Romans are also bringing with them, um, and it's just a part of the evolution of culture. Uh, as one empire declines, it sort of gets absorbed into the next one to come along. I would be remiss if I said that women were not being depicted at all, um, because we do have sarcophagi like this, with clearly a female figure on it, in that same sort of symposium pose that we noticed before. She is painted. This is carved out of stone. It is not terracotta. Um, and it's coming from this very, very late uh, Etruscan period. Um, so we'll notice... Here is a last vestige of, of women within that active sphere, but even in this, this wonderful example of a woman being featured in, uh, in late Etruscan art, there is again that sort of lack of vitality that we saw in the earlier piece. Now we'll notice with her she is being represented in a much more naturalistic way. She's not nearly as abstract or stylized as her archaic counterparts. Um, so again, that is very much mimicking what we saw as the development of the figure in ancient Greece. And it's going to be very much in line with what we'll see next week with early Republican uh, sculpture in Rome, uh, which will be much more interested in realism um, and veracity as opposed to uh, that stylized notion that we saw with the early Etruscans. So again, a very nice... Uh, reminder that women are still a part of the culture, a nice reminder of that, but in in a much diminished place and not nearly as frequent or prominent as they had been in the Archaic period. And finally, we'll end this week looking at this guy, Ole Matele, uh, who is an Etruscan orator uh, in the city of Rome. And the only way we really know he's Etruscan is by his name. Uh, this is coming from about the first century BCE. Uh, to give us a little bit of uh, point to time frame here, it was after 89, the year 89 BCE, uh, the Romans will make all Italians Roman citizens. So Rome has expanded to the point where they issue a decree. All people living on the peninsula of Italy are now Roman citizens. You are now members of the Roman Republic. Uh, so this guy, he's Etruscan in name and in heritage, but everything else here is purely Roman. From the boots on his feet, to the toga that he wears, to the ring on his finger, uh, to the pose. This is a classic um, uh, Roman orator pose. Um, all of those things are purely Roman. He's become completely absorbed into Roman culture. Uh, this is about a life-size bronze piece. So again, lots of sophistication and skill. But very indicative of this entire process we see, especially after the decline of Superbus, uh, the Etruscans are just getting absorbed into Roman culture uh, and becoming a part of the Roman Republic. Um, essentially, what the Romans will attempt to do is homogenize the entire Italian peninsula uh, so that all people speak Latin, uh, build temples to the same pantheon of gods and goddesses, uh, and really come into line with uh, the Roman way of life and the Roman way of doing things. Um, that's simply the way it goes in ancient history. We've seen it over and over again. Uh, really, the strength of Rome will be their ability to absorb and homogenize cultures around them. But we will get into that in detail next week. Uh, for this week, just to recap a few things with the Etruscans. Uh, they have a great deal of similarity uh, in terms of culture to what we saw with the ancient Greeks, but it's important to remember they are distinctively different. Uh, and we do believe that they are 
native to Italy, and so it's very remarkable that they have such a, a distinctive culture that's so similar and yet you know, so distinctively different. Um, they were the major cultural influence on the Italian peninsula from about the 7th century BCE until the rise of Rome, um, and finally the overthrow of the Etruscan king in 509 BCE. Uh, after that, what we'll see is because of that and the eventual economic and military defeats uh, that the Etruscans suffer at the hands of the Greeks and the Phoenicians, uh, that's just the end for Etruscans. They don't really go out in a blaze of glory. They basically eventually just get absorbed into the superstructure of Rome. Uh, so because of that, they will form an important foundation for Rome. We will see Lots of little holdovers, little things from Eturia that will pop up again in Rome next week. So with that, we will end things this week. As always, if you have any questions or concerns, um, anything you want to ask about the current writing assignment, what have you, please email me. My email address can be found on our Blackboard website. Uh, until next time, then, I will talk at you later.